I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to the people of the Kulin Nation. Tonight, with fewer GPs choosing to bulk bill, can you afford to see a doctor? The average out-of-pocket cost is $40. If you're on JobSeeker, that's most of your daily allowance. So what's the solution to a broken health system? On the panel, American literature and culture expert Sarah Churchwell, who's in Australia for the <laughs> Melbourne Writers' Festival this weekend. Researcher and Aboriginal Affairs commentator Anthony Dillon, who is a strong opponent of the voice to Parliament. The Minister for Health and Aged Care and the member for Hindmarsh, Mark Butler. The Liberal member for Bass, Bridget Archer, whose home state of Tasmania seems a step closer to securing a team in the AFL. And GP and former president of the Australian Medical Association, Mukesh Aikawal. And what will it take to stop young people vaping? Stream us around the country on iView and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag. Please get involved. To get us started tonight, here's a question from Sigrid Barr. Nicotine vapes have been banned from sale in Australia unless the person has a prescription to access. I'm a 20-year-old and I know this has not really achieved much for my age group as access to nicotine vapes is still very easy. What is being done by the government to further combat this issue in what is becoming a major concern in younger age groups? Mark Butler. Well, thank you for that question. Um, vapes were sold to governments and communities around the world as a therapeutic product to get long-term smokers to quit, to help them quit. It was not sold as a recreational product targeted at our kids, but that's what it's become. Vape stores now set up down the road from schools, um, one in four Australians aged 18 to 24 has vaped. One in six teenagers, high school students, has vaped because the product is deliberately targeted at them. Vapes are disguised as highlighter pens, as USB sticks, so that people can take them to school. And it is having a really significant health effect on our youngest Australians. Uh, this is a deliberate strategy by the tobacco industry to create a new generation of nicotine addicts. And far from being a pathway out of cigarettes, which is what it was promoted to us as, it's becoming a pathway into cigarettes for younger people. You're three times more likely to take up smoking if you've vaped than if you haven't. Uh, so I'm determined to stamp out this public health menace because that's what I think it genuinely is. So uh, what, what are you going to do? Well, over the next several hours, actually, I'll be announcing our response tomorrow to this public health menace. Uh, I've talked very closely with my state and territory health minister colleagues. They're determined to work with us on that. We've, uh, we've consulted closely with the tobacco control sector, um, peak doctor groups and many others besides. And we had the Therapeutic Goods Administration, the TGA, uh, conduct a very deep consultation over the course of summer. I mean, if these are genuinely therapeutic products, then they should only be available in therapeutic settings, which is essentially pharmacies. This idea that they can be readily accessed by young people, all young people say they can, in convenience stores and so many other places besides, deliberately targeted at them. They have pink unicorns on them. They are bubblegum flavoured. These are not therapeutic products marketed at adults. They are, de they are deliberately designed to be attractive to kids and I'm determined to stop it. So, Minister, you are making a, a big announcement on this tomorrow, given we're all here tonight, the Secret's asking about it. Um, can you just give us an insight? Are we looking at banning the importation of all vapes? Well, we're going to need a comprehensive response, but you've got to start from the position that this is a therapeutic product um, designed to help long-term smokers get off the cigarettes. That's it. So, in that case, it should be only sold in therapeutic settings. So, not retail stores, not the convenience That's store right. down the street. And, 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 and only products that are pharmaceutical style, the plain package, the plain products, they don't have flavours. 
Uh, only those products should be coming into Australia as far as I'm concerned. So ban, ban retail sales. Well, plain packaging. You're just r roping me in. I'm just asking David. the question. <laughs> what am I going to say tomorrow now? <laughs> what am I going to say I'm sure tomorrow? everyone will tune in. Look, I, I mean, I think it's been... This is now the number one behavioural issue in high schools mm. and, and it's rapidly becoming a really serious behavioural yes. issue in primary schools. Here in Victoria, the Poisons Hotline in the last 12 months has taken 50 calls from kids under four. Under four? Under four who have ingested vapes. I mean, this is a very serious problem we're facing and it's exploded over the last few years. While we were focused on the pandemic, it has utterly exploded and we've got to deal with it now. Because Sigrid, if we don't... Let, sorry to interrupt. Sigrid, let me just come back to you. I mean, as you mentioned, you're 20 years old. How prevalent is it amongst you and your friends and people your age? Have you tried it yourself? Um, I've tried it once, didn't like how it felt like, didn't like the effect it had on me, so I've never touched it again, but it is huge among my age group. I'm not in a college environment, it's like pretty common there, but yeah, all my friends from school, they still do it. I'm a nursing student myself, so just the concern that I have as a future healthcare worker, what the cost will have on our healthcare industry, it's already struggling, but um, yeah, I, it is really rampant, what yeah. I feel. Um, Mukesh Hockel, well, let me ask you from a, a doctor's perspective, how worried should we be about vaping? Uh, I couldn't uh, cross anything the Minister said. He's absolutely right. Um, we've had great success with tobacco. And, in fact, because of that success, we've seen this lurching into a different poison. And it is a poison. Um, and uh, how, how, how dangerous, though, compared to um, cigarette smoking? Well, the actual nicotine is one part of it. But the other part of it is it does actually act as a hook. And so the problem is we've had young people actually going the other way. We've, we've managed to get mm. the number of proportion of young people off smokes significantly down, and now it's starting to trend the other way. And so uh, this is absolutely, uh, for the health sector, but for the community, a major issue that has to be addressed. Sarah, in the UK where you live, how big an issue... Is, is vaping there? Does what you're hearing tonight resonate with your experience? Yeah, it actually does, and it's a, it's a growing concern in the UK as well. There have been recent reports similarly uh, re reporting this explosion of use, use among very young people who are not supposed to be able to get a hold of it. I think that the point about it being used as, um, you know, that it's meant to be a therapeutic uh, remedy also means that in public minds and in the minds of young people that they, they interpret it as being safer, mm. and as you're saying, it's actually not necessarily safer, um, and of course it's an addiction drug and it is a poison and a toxin in all of those ways. So the UK is going to be facing very similar, okay. is facing very similar conversations. And, and Bridget Archer, what about, what about your perspective on this? Some Liberals are often less interventionist, you know, let, let people make their own uh, choices and so on. What do you think about the sort of bans that the Minister's hinting at tonight? Well, they're dangerous products. These are dangerous products. They're addictive as cigarettes, but they're also, they have the long-term health effects that cigarettes have, and they are not being used as smoking cessation aids. They're being used by young people. They're being used by very young uh, children. And I think, you know, we've done years and years of work uh, on tobacco, uh, and now I, I feel that we've, we've got this new frontier that we're going mm. to have to deal with. Should it be banned? With the, the banned well, it certainly like... needs to be uh, more tightly controlled. I think it is a, a public health um, mm an urgent public health issue. Because your National Party colleagues are suggesting relaxing some of the rules, letting um, nicotine vapes be sold over the counter for over 18s uh, with some plain packaging, similar to the way cigarette products are sold. Would you support that sort of move? Look, I, I think that um, if it's intended to be a therapeutic product for mm. an aid, a smoking cessation aid, then I would agree that it should be sold in a therapeutic um, setting. And we know that these are really dangerous products and mm. we should be seeking to, particularly for young people and for children, uh, ensuring that we're not creating another whole generation um, of, uh, of problem like we saw with cigarettes. Well, this is in fact the topic of our online poll tonight. We're asking you, should all vapes be banned for anyone without a prescription? You can cast your votes on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. And we'll bring you the results on that a little later. We're going to turn now to the GP crisis, as it's being called. The difficulty in finding an affordable doctor. And I'd like to bring in uh, Jamie Tonor. Uh, Jamie, what's been your experience? I guess... Um, <coughs> when are we going to take it seriously? Um, how can we say that we're a lucky country and it's free healthcare for all, when this is not the case? 
something that something that should be a high priority for all governments is our health care and we're in a position of crisis and I feel like there's no action plan and that we will continue to be worsened. Is this going to be Australia's new normal? Jamie, what's, what, what have you experienced when it comes um, to trying to find affordable health care? Just for myself, um, trying to get a marina. I mm. went to my local GP, who's a bulk billing G GP. $500, they wanted to charge me for that procedure. I went to the local Werribee Women's Hub and for the same procedure, $380 out of pocket. Um, I have a child that needed a referral to the Children's Hospital. Um, two years. <clears throat> Two years I waited to see the specialist. This, Two years this is, away, yeah. yeah, this is just my family, so I, I, and I'm just one person. Well, uh, first let me go to you, uh, Mukesh Haikawal, on that point, and thank you, Jamie, for the, for the question. Why would the cost be so much higher at the GP than at a women's health clinic? The uh, issue with the general practice sector is it's been uh, under the quash for an awful long time. So we've actually had um, yours and my rebate as patients uh, has been st uh, stymied for at least 15 years. So if you look at it, it's grown by 0.5% a year. And of course, the value of that has then therefore been eroded. Um, general practice is a small business and it's important that we um, stay uh, uh, afloat to be able to provide those services. Um, what's happened in those 15 years is that people have actually continued to provide that service uh, 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 without a, an out-of-pocket. Many people, the large proportion, you'll see the, f the stats around 90, 89% of people getting their services without an out-of-pocket. And that's become untenable uh, because we all know costs have actually increased. So what we have tried to do amongst the, the practices is to see how can we uh, provide those services um, and a practice like mine, we do have times when we are not charging out of pockets, uh, but there are times when we, we, we have to, <coughs> especially out of hours, especially late at night, when costs of, 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 of uh, the services increase. So the problems we have are, and I've you know, uh, heard this quite you know, well articulated across the sector, is that people aren't staying. People who could work a bit longer are, are retiring early. Mm. Uh, people are uh, not st staying in. Uh, and we can't attract new people into the system. Uh, people who are being attracted from internationally have to go through many uh, hurdles which are stymieing their process through. And of course, the younger people coming through medical school at 14% only, used to be 50% plus, mm. uh, are actually not choosing general practice mm. as, a, as a career. So we need significant support to the sector. Um, the way we do our business has changed over time and will continue to evolve. But the core problem that we have is that you and I, as citizens, have been dudded for 15 years with a level of the rebate that we're provided for. And I want to come to the Minister with uh, a question on the, the, that, that rebate. Um, but Anthony <coughs> Dillon, let me bring you in on this because you're in fact, uh, I should point out, a practising psychologist. You've got some experience in the health system. Do you notice this problem about accessing GP services and indeed bulk billing GP services is becoming more acute? Uh, so look, certainly I get a lot of clients, um, they'll get a referral mm. from a GP. Um, you know, depending on where they are, they are if, if, like I deal with a lot of Aboriginal clients, often there's an Aboriginal medical service where they can get a GP, get a referral to me, right. and I will then see them via telehealth. Um, so I often deal with Aboriginal clients, but certainly for uh, many other people, yeah, I have heard of, of long waiting times, but um, it's not months or anything like that by the time they come to see me. Yeah, OK, but it's, it's obviously happening with other uh, specialists from, yeah. from what we've heard. So, Mark Butler... What's the answer to this, uh, coming back to Jamie's <clears throat> question? Well, uh, there is no one answer. There's, there's the need to overhaul Medicare um, because the, the system we have now was designed for the 1980s and the health needs of the country is very different. So we've been working with the sector over the last six months on, on a plan really to make it a very different type of system that responds much more to ongoing complex chronic needs of an older population with more chronic disease than the sort of episodic care we used to get in the 80s. So that's one. You can't just put more money into the existing system. You have to make the system better suited to the needs of the country today and we will be doing that. At National Cabinet last week the Prime Minister announced 
um, a package that goes part the way to responding to the Strengthening Medicare Task Force that we received earlier this year. Uh, next week in the budget there will be more because I said at the last election I've got no higher priority as a health minister than general practice. I think general practice is in the worst shape it has been certainly in the 40 year history of Medicare. So does that mean the rebate, the Medicare rebate that a GP receives when you go visit them will be finally increased above that, what is it, $39.75? Well, I'm not going to announce what we're doing in the budget. Clearly, there are financial pressures on general practice. There's also the change to the system we want to see happen to better reflect the needs of patients in the 2020s, not the 1980s. We've got to do all of that. And as Mukesh said, we've got to make general practice more attractive. I mean, if only one in seven medical graduates are choosing general practice as their preferred career instead of one in two, which is what it was not too long ago, if you think it's hard to find a doctor now, in five or ten years when the current generation is retired, it will be a real problem. Well, just to, sorry that, to interrupt sorry, you there. just to finish, yeah. all of that ends up at the hospital. Yeah. Every failing in the health system around the community, it all ends up um, in the emergency department, crowding out an already very stressed hospital system. I, I, I want to come back to some of the solutions here, but you, mentioned, you both mentioned the, the fact that fewer and fewer medical graduates are choosing general practice. We've got a medical student uh, here tonight, Isabel Lee. Yep. Um, Isabel, what's going through your mind at the moment about would, would general practice be an option for you? Yeah, thank you. Good evening. Um, so, yeah, as a medical student, I'm here with a number of other medical students. I personally am interested in general practice, but every time I tell someone that I am, I get very strange looks. And it's because we're here as medical students. We go to placement, we sit with our GPs, and we see them struggling with patient numbers, struggling to run essentially small businesses. And whereas we spend the majority of time in hospitals and in comparison, the choice seems very clear. Um, however, as you have both mentioned, this is becoming crisis, GPs. We need more GPs, but it's just not a very... Like, people are being disincentivized from pursuing this pathway, um, especially with the cost of living crisis right now. So what are some ways you are planning on increasing retention interest in GP pathway and ultimately the, you know, Medicare co-payment scheme needs to be improved to improve people's interest in this pathway? So, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Minister. Uh, well, please be a general practitioner. <laughs> Follow your dreams. I'm not sure that the Follow pleading is going to be enough um, to get medical students as, over the line. As Mukesh said, uh, look, the last 15 years have seen, I think, a devaluing of the role of general practice, the value of general practice, which is the backbone of our healthcare system. And so we as government and all governments need to show young medical graduates like yourself how much we value general practice, just how utterly central we think general practice is to a properly functioning healthcare system and frankly that cultural change needs to happen right through the health system. I, I hear of students all the time at their hospital saying to a supervisor I want to be a general practitioner and being, and being the, the response is why would you want to do that? Why, why, why don't you be an, an anaesthetist or a, or a surgeon? I mean, the health system has to value general practice as well. But of course we've got to make it a financially more attractive proposition than it is, and that goes really back to the point that Mukesh made and the response that we intend to roll out in coming days and weeks. All right, so we'll wait for the budget to hear more on that. Anthony, did you want to...? Oh, look, what I've heard is frightening, <coughs> and, you know, for us city folk, and I can't help but think in remote areas where you have a large proportion of Indigenous Australians, how it's going to impact on them. So, you know, uh, the question you've got to ask also, on top of what you've already got to do, is how can we attract GPs, good GPs, out to remote areas? Mm. There was, um, there was a re review, a report last year that, uh, from Deloitte Access Economics. It said we're, we're going to face in the next decade a shortage of something like 11,000 <coughs> GPs. This is getting worse. Um, Bridget Archer, bulk billing rates in Tassie in your state are even lower. They're like 6.9%, way below the national average. Listening to the Minister, what, what do you think? What should be done? Well, I think it's complex and I think the Minister's raised some of the issues um, around Medicare and, um, and Makesh as well, around strengthening uh, the Medicare system. But I think what Anthony said is very true and certainly true in a con context of Tasmania and other regions. Attracting doctors and retaining doctors but also getting them out into the regions is really difficult. And um, it's hard enough to attract doctors to come and work in the city uh, where, you know, you get some of those economies of scale as well that are important uh, for 
for business and for general practice. Uh, but out into the regions, it's really difficult. And in Tasmania, in northern Tasmania, in my electorate, you know, there are places that, that don't have any doctors. There are um, long distances that people have to <coughs> travel to get access to um, general practice at all, let alone at any cost. Um, and, you know, in parts like the central highlands of Tasmania, you know, we're seeing uh, a contracting of GP services and uh, less and less access. It does hit the health system in terms of the hospital system, uh, but it's also, uh, you know, it, it means that people are, are sicker so as well. is it paying doctors more, the answer? I don't think it's the whole answer. I think that there's got to be a look at the whole system. There's got to be a look at um, paying doctors more. What is it that's going to attract doctors to um, rural and remote areas? And that's a, a whole range of things. It's salary, it's lifestyle, it's all of those sorts of things um, as well. Training is important where doctors are trained um, and where they have the the ability to, to be trained so that they're not, for example, going away from Tasmania and then we're having to attract them mm. um, to come back as well. So I think there are a lot of moving parts and mm. um, the government needs to turn its mind to all of the moving parts, not just the, the cost component, which is of course part of it. Yeah, Mukesh, let me just come back to you on this. Yeah. What, what do you make of what you've heard and what sort of increase in that rebate would you like to see? Well, I mean, I think the rebate is going to be part of the, <coughs> the, the answer, and I can't give you a dollar sum. Um, the last time we saw an injection like this into Medicare announced was back in 2004. And at that stage, we went from 85% MBS as your rebate to 100%, and we had things called bulk bid incentives. Um, and, you know, we're seeing a similar mm. injection. So the hope is that there is some redistribution in a way that's going to make it more attractive. I would say to you, I've been working in general practice for over 30 years. Uh, it's a wonderful career. You see everything from cradle to grave. You have the joy and the pain of people's uh, illness and health. Um, but what you're going to negotiate at the moment is a whole lot of red tape and other things that can be overcome. It's overcome with thought, good interactions, and wanting to make the system work and work better, in particularly for your patients around you. But in doing that, it makes your life better too. And that's the way we've got to go. And I think that one thing is certainly cash, but the other is the, the whole persona, perception. So in hospitals, we used to have um, release from hospital training posts for uh, people who weren't doing general practice to have a taste. And that was very useful. Mm. Um, we, we, th there are some other ways to incentivise the process. And that's actually uh, uh, what, what's going to be looked at. Um, and this whole business of working in teams um, is something that we've grown with, grown accustomed to, and actually you don't get quite so bored because you're not stuck in a room on your own. You've got other people around you. And I think that's going to be one of the ways forward, embracing team praise. Well, team Isabel, uh, thank you very much for your question. We wish you well. If you're just joining us, you're watching Q&A live with Sarah Churchwell, Anthony Dillon, Mark Butler, Bridget Archer and Mukesh Heikerwal. We'll get to more of your health questions shortly, but next we'll hear from Sydney Montero. Thank you. Being a firm Republican, I see the institution of monarchy being outdated and a constant reminder of all Canolian injustices. My question to the panel is, do you plan to pl pledge your allegiance or their allegiance to the new monarch? Um, and if you do, what value, if any, is there in doing that in today's modern day Australia? Sydney, thank you. And in case anyone's unaware, for the first time with the, uh, the King's coronation uh, coming up on the weekend, everyone in the UK and the Commonwealth uh, is being invited to pledge their allegiance to the King. Let me just quickly check before we get into the substance of Sydney's question, who's going to be pledging allegiance when they're watching the coronation, or if you're going to be watching the coronation? Will you be...? <laughs> I'm American. Absolutely not. Anthony? <laughs> It'll be business, business as usual for me. Does that mean pledging allegiance? No. no. Mark Butler? I, I think I already have. <laughs> I think I, Come I, I on. Think we you have, have, I think we an answer to as a cabinet when he you... automatically became King of Australia. Well, OK, but... Well, so I don't intend to do you it. You don't again. intend to, Bridget Archer? <laughs> I'm not sure I'll be there watching that live okay. broadcast. OK, and Mukesh? 
No, my father went in uh, 1953 to the last coronation. Went to the, the, the late oh, Queen's yeah, coronation. Yeah. So I was thinking about going this time, okay. but I'm not going. <laughs> All right, well, um, let, me check the, let me check the room. Uh, put your hand up if you are intending to pledge your allegiance to the King at the coronation. There's very... Look, one, two hands in the air. What if you're not... Uh, going to pledge allegiance. A few more hands in the air. OK. Uh, well, <laughs> let me come back to you, Sarah. So the, the, the question from Sydney, what value, if any, is there uh, in pledging allegiance in today's modern-day Australia? Mm. Well, uh, you know, <clears throat> my perspective as an American who lives in London um, is that uh, I do... I, you know, I was raised with an American Pledge of Allegiance, right? That's what every American school child recites. It's not a question um, there. So, no, so, no, it's not. And, it, and it's intended to build national unity, right? That's, mm. that's what it's for. And one can understand why societies need to do that. I think that for former colonies and for Commonwealth nations, um, it becomes a complicated story where you've got these multiple allegiances that you're being asked or multiple loyalties that people are being asked to negotiate. It makes perfect sense to me why the vast majority of people in this room would not feel that they need to pledge allegiance um, to a monarch of, of what they see as another country. These so are two where do you think this, where's this idea come from? Because this traditionally has not happened. Is it about trying to connect people or something like that? I suspect that it is, and I think that it's... Um, and, and, I, and I'm not sure that it's going to play even any better in Britain than, uh, than it sounds like it's playing here. I mean, certainly in Britain right now, um, there, is, there is a great deal of... One hears a lot of resentment, actually, at the, at the cost of the monarchy. Mm. I mean, oh, sorry, at the cost at of the, the coronation. coronation. I mean, right. the monarchy, too. Um, that, was not a, that was not a Freudian slip, exactly. Um, but at, at specifically at the cost of the coronation, when the cost of living crisis is biting, and, you know, people are struggling to feed their families, and then they're watching millions and millions of tax uh, dollars, pounds, being spent, um, you know, on, on this celebration of this already very wealthy and very powerful individual. So it's not playing particularly well, and, and I'm not sure that trying to do something like a Pledge of Allegiance uh, is, 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 is going to and rectify those very practical and, and real well, concerns that people have. Anthony, uh, Sydney suggests the monarchy is um, an outdated and constant reminder of past colonial injustices. Is that how you see it? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, that's, uh, if people want to see that, they can, but uh, I just see it as, you know, the, the family over there in England, uh, I don't have any particular allegiance to them at all. I don't have any disrespect to them either. Are you a Republican or...? Uh, undecided, really. You know, undecided? Uh, yeah. OK. Uh, and, Mark Butler, why won't you pledge allegiance during the coronation? Well, <clears throat> I mean, I, I campaigned for a republic. I voted for a republic, but I'm a... I'm a member of Parliament who has voted to work within the existing system and at the moment, because we lost that, that referendum, the existing system has the, the, the British royal family as our, as our monarchs. Um, every time we get elected to the Parliament we have to start by pledging allegiance or uh, affirming or swearing allegiance and we did that last year. I think that's enough. You don't think you need to do it again? <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's hear from uh, Ramey Messenger. This is a question for Sarah Churchwell. Um, I'm an American Australian. Back in America, I worked often in African American communities doing theater. The concept of white privilege has always made complete sense to me uh, to understand historical perspective. I don't take it personally. I take it as factual history. I know that unearned advantage has helped me and protected me. But the, <laughs> but the term white privilege is now emotionally loaded, and I would really love to hear your comments about that whole concept of white privilege. So. Well, thank you very much. And I'd, and I'd love to talk more uh, to you later about your perspective as an Australian-American because, you know, I, I, I joked a minute ago that I'm an American and that's why I won't be um, pledging allegiance to the, um, to the king. I am, in fact, a dual citizen. I am um, American-British uh, legally, but not emotionally. And the... the well, because I wanted to vote. That's why I became a British citizen. I lived there and I was paying taxes and I decided I wasn't going to disenfranchise myself. Mm. So it was a political decision, and, um, and, but not an emotive one. And we have 
have these emotive relationships to our own histories and to our own identities. They become, uh, we, they, they become very fraught um, when people start to feel that something that they identify themselves around is being threatened or attacked in some way. And white privilege as a way of trying to identify, as you say, I think your phrase is a really good one, to identify unearned advantages that have benefited people. Um, I think it's become problematic partly because, as we were just saying, there are so many people struggling in a cost of living crisis in the US, in the UK, who don't feel that unearned advantage. And so when they are told that they are, that they are the beneficiaries of something called white privilege, and they look around them and they see that they can't put food in their children's mouths and that they can't send their kids to university, they're not sure what this white privilege thing is and it makes them really angry. And one can understand that. But one can also understand the historical legacies that you're talking about and the ways in which when we talk about individual experience and then broad social generalizations that we sometimes have to make when we talk about the way that groups have operated across history. And so for me, it's really a question about trying actually to be less emotive about history, to make a, a distinction between our ideas about memory and identity, which can be very personal and community-based and family-based, and then and a history that tries to be more dispassionate, that tries to make the kinds of observations that you're making that says, look, on the whole, the fact is, is in the US and in the UK and in Australia, white people generally benefited from systems that generally disadvantaged non-white people. That is a fact, regardless of how individuals may feel about that history. And it's a demonstrable <laughs> fact, as you say. It is, it is actually beyond argument. So I think that what we need to do is to, is to is to think about history the way that we try to talk about our politics today, which is to try to be more inclusive, to try to listen to other perspectives, and, and to stop getting, and, and to stop seeing it as something that we have to protect or safeguard or to get threatened about, to say, look, history happened, how can we do better? We just need to try to do better, and history is all that we have to learn from. So instead of getting upset about it, we need to pay attention to each other and try to create a history that includes multiple perspectives and, uh, and recognizes the ways that the present is a legacy of all of those um, past choices. Anthony, is... <laughs> Let me bring you in on this point. <clears throat> is, is white privilege a reality? OK, could, uh, I think it's greatly exaggerated. It's a, it's a reality, and I'm talking about the Australian hmm, experience. Sure. Uh, certainly here, in the context of Aboriginal Australians, it's um, it greatly exaggerated. It's just become something to talk about endlessly when, in actual fact, we know that we have... Uh, and, yes, I acknowledge history, and I've seen many Indigenous Australians in this country demonstrate that they're not victims of the past or the history, but um, only victims of their view of the past or the history, because we have many, many, many successful uh, Indigenous Australians. Uh, one of them often sits in that seat there, mm. but not tonight. <laughs> and there's many more like him. Um, so, yes, I don't discount it, but we shouldn't make it bigger mm. than what it actually is, because if we do, it then becomes a disincentive for... Uh, some Indigenous people to do something, they think, oh, well, no use doing anything, white privilege is against me. But when you in look fact, at... I've seen many people uh, in universities and elsewhere with black privilege here in Australia. You know, they've, they can shut down a conversation immediately um, just by saying, I'm, I'm offended. So. Yeah, but when you look at the close the gap Keep targets... Keep going. <laughs> when you look at the, um, the annual close the gap targets, for example, and yep. the, the lack of progress, the big gap between... Uh, indigenous, non-indigenous uh, <coughs> outcomes on, on health, on life expectancy, education. W what do you put that down to? OK, sure. Well, first of all, we shouldn't just assume that the gap is caused by due to racism or white privilege. No, but what do you put it down to? Uh, there's, there's many factors. Um, so, location, uh, remoteness. And just today, I was watching... I've watched this clip many times um, between you and, and Stan from eight years ago, where he spoke about, in remote areas, we have some tough questions mm. uh, to answer, where we've got to seriously consider a sensitive exit strategy for them. So I'm not saying close down remote communities, and I'm not saying that cities are the great utopia, but I'm just saying uh, in, in some remote communities we need to seriously consider a sensitive exit strategy such that they can have the sorts of opportunities that you and I have. But and that disadvantage isn't just in remote yeah, communities, is it? Yeah, no, but more often than not, you, that's where you get a lot of it, mm. in re remoteness where they, they don't have access to doctors, um, libraries, gyms and, you know, fresh food. Well, I, I've got to ask, would it, would it help to have an Indigenous voice that can advise Parliament and Government on ways to address that? I don't think so, because what I've just said, we all know, and we've, we know that without this voice. Uh, now, just one final thing on the, on the gap. 
Uh, I think we should be more focused on what I call the within or the internal gap, gap and that is the gap between not Indigenous and non-Indigenous, but the gap between those Indigenous people who are really suffering and those Indigenous people who are doing very, very well. If you close that gap, you will automatically cl close the other gap because there are many Indigenous Australians who are doing very, very well. And we want to, they're successful. We want to replicate that success. Sarah, let me come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> You, uh, you've written a book about Gone with the Wind, uh, the, the classic novel and, and film. Um, tell us about your thesis about how this classic story has influenced the America we see today. Mm. Well, basically, what I think it does for people who are, uh, who are familiar with the story, um, it, it, it captures, which doesn't mean that it creates or that it produces, but it, but it reflects and captures um, one, one other aspect of white experience that is certainly, I think, shaping American politics today, which is um, what I call the myth of white grievance, which is the idea that white people are the victims in uh, uh, the story of American history, and that, and that, that that happens when, uh, when any attempt to, uh, to to balance an inequality, um, that when you when one has the sense that power is being taken away, then one feels victimized by that. And I think we're seeing a resurgence of that attitude in um, many of the people who voted for Trump and now what we're calling kind of Trumpism, Trump-style politics of grievance um, that says these people are coming after my life, they're coming after my way of life, instead of just saying these people also want to be able to be free to live their lives, and it may be in different ways from the way that I live mine. And I, it's a it's a you know, 400-page book, so I can't very well uh, uh, kind of <laughs> uh, exactly capture it all tonight. But but basically, it's about the ways in which the attitudes and the emotions and the fantasies and the lies, and and I say lies deliberately because they're lies about American history. They were very deliberate lies that were told in the immediate aftermath of the American Civil War about why it was fought, how it was fought, what happened, and those lies shaped then you know a, a century and a half of American politics and culture. So most of all, it's really about what happens when you have a society that's in denial about its own history and the, the dangers of trying to, uh, to live in what, you know, when, when Trump was in office, we, people used that phrase alternate reality and they said, you know, Trump has so, so successfully created this kind of alternate reality in the United States and how did he do it so fast and so easily? When you actually look back at mm. the American attitudes to the Civil War and its aftermath, we've been in an alternate reality for 160 years. All right, let's uh, hear next from Dylan Dury. As medical students, we learn of the health effects on, on the disadvantaged in our society. <coughs> Additionally, there is significant psychological distress associated with lower income levels. With the rising cost of living and job seeker payments coming in well below the poverty line at only $50 a day, what health cost is the government willing to accept by not raising JobKeeper? Glad we've got so many uh, medical students here tonight. Minister, let me go to you on that. Uh, well, um, let, let, me, let me say, let's sort of turn the question back to the question of JobSeeker. <clears throat> because as, as I think most people know, uh, we've received a couple of very important reports over the last few weeks. One from the Economic Inclusion Committee that has made a series of recommendations, probably the most significant of which is around the rate of job seeker. They also talked about rent assistance and about single parent payments and such like. <clears throat> and I can assure you that has been very much at the forefront of our deliberations as we on the ERC, the, the budget committee effectively of government, has been crafting the budget for next week. And um, you can be sure that, that a focus on the most vulnerable Australians, and you're talking about one of the most vulnerable group of Australians we have, has been a very big part of our budget preparation. Unfortunately, though, you're going to have to wait and tune in on Tuesday night uh, next week and watch very dapper Jim Chalmers deliver his first proper budget, not the election budget. But do you accept budget? what Dylan's but talking about here? There are worse outcomes because yeah. people on Job Seeker are, are just receiving too little. Well, we, we, know, we know there are significant health disparities within our community. Poorer Australians experience poorer health. But is the That's... rate of Job Seeker contributing to that? Well, Poverty contributes to that. Does the rate whatever, of job whatever your driver of poverty is, and and you know you're very familiar. The question from Dylan is: Does the rate of job seeker contribute to that? We know that poverty uh, contributes to poor health outcomes. We, we know that, and so for people on job seeker, um, we know that the communities where those people tend to live experience poorer health outcomes, poorer access to doctors, 
much poorer access to psychologists, very, very little access to psychologists in spite of the fact that they experience much higher levels of mental distress than they do in wealthier communities. So yes, this is a, this is a very familiar story. So a high job story. seeker rate would help their health outcomes? Well, that was a very clear recommendation of the committee and we've, we've looked at that recommendation very closely. But you can have there's to a, wait there's a report week. tonight on the uh, Seven Networks, Mark Riley's reported that there will be an increase in the budget in job seeker, yeah. but only for those over the age of 55. Uh, they're uh, predominantly women. Uh, they're often finding it harder to get back into work at that age. Mm. Is that what we can expect? Well, I, I don't think you're right to say they're predominantly women. Uh, you know, male long-term unemployment at that age is very significant mm. I think as well, has been for decades. Um, but th look, there have, there's been a bit of speculation tonight. There will be more speculation between now and next Tuesday night, I suspect, about what's in the budget. Um, some of it's wider the mark, some of it's close to the mark. You're okay. just going to have Schreiber to wait till Tuesday. Okay, we're all waiting for Tuesday. Uh, Mukesh Shakerwal, <laughs> the, um, the, the point made there, do you notice as a GP uh, when somebody is living in poverty, someone is on job seeker, that they are presenting with uh, worse um, health issues? Absolutely. The um, many things increase people's illness and their recovery from illness is prolonged if they are from certain socioeconomic groups, uh, racial groups, uh, uh, CIFA groups and so on. Um, and are they less likely to come to the doctor? Potentially, yes. We, I mean, one of the problems with when we had COVID, mm. don't forget it's still around, by the way, but during the COVID time, people weren't going to see the doctor for other reasons. Now they're going for the, for the reason that they maybe can't afford it. By the time they present, it's later, and their sequela of having the illness is more pronounced, and they get take longer to get, get, to get sicker. Um, on your specific question, um, a few years ago, to the festival you're, you're going to, um, Sir Michael Marmot came and gave a speech uh, to that in 2016, I think it was. Um, and so, you know, he's a, he's a great advocate for this area. Um, he talks about health in all policies and all the aspects of life into, into interacting with health. And he talks about health and healthcare um, and access to that for all people. Uh, and uh, the, the need to have health in all policies is actually part of the drive that will turn that around. So if there was health in the policy of the Treasurer and the Finance Minister, potentially they'd see the benefit of investing in health now to reduce the cost on health later, but investing in the, in the, uh, in the individual and the economy into the future. Bridget Archer, you are amongst those who have signed this public letter calling for an increase in the rate of job seeker. What sort of increase would you like to see? Well, one that lifts people out of poverty, um, because the, the answer to that question is absolutely, like, people that are living on JobSeeker are overwhelmingly living below the poverty line, and um, they are, are having uh, poorer health outcomes, they have mm. poorer access to nutrition, they have poorer access to, um, you know, quality housing, all of those sorts of things. And we're seeing in my own electorate, you know, um, I was meeting with emergency service providers in the last couple of weeks who are just in since Christmas seeing an increase uh, in people presenting to them, people living in tents in, in the city of Launceston, you know, in 2023, people living in tents and single mothers with children living in cars. And we know that um, during the coronavirus pandemic, for example, uh, when the coronavirus supplement was in place, that there was evidence that showed that it did lift people out of poverty, that people were able to access um, some of that health care that they hadn't been able to. They were able to um, provide more nutritious uh, food for their families uh, and heat their homes better and all of those sorts of things. It, it has to be raised with um, historically low rates of unemployment that we have got now. There's no excuse so for how, keeping can I ask people you this, living though, in those conditions. As an uh, elected politician, how, how should that be paid for? Because it's not cheap, increasing job seeker, whatever you do. Well, are, you, are you willing to say where that should come from? Government has to make those um, decisions all the time and, you know... Um, you must yeah. have given this some thought, sure. Sure. Um, but, I mean, for example, in uh, my own home state, um, the Prime Minister arrived on the weekend to commit funds for a stadium, you know, so that... Um, you know, Tasmanians can um, have a, a new football stadium in Hobart. And whilst 
that might be, you know, great. And the football um, fans amongst us. We may um, have a question coming up on that. Uh, you know, fact, and um, I might that like to, but I mean, it's difficult for yeah. people to see um, the priorities. But that, there. that's that's not going to uh, fund much of a job seeker increase. We're talking billions when it comes to job seeker. Um, Stage three tax cuts, do you look at reining those in or some other area to find some money? Well, I think we have to look at what it, what it takes. And, I, and we are talking about a Labor government. This is a Labor government who was elected on a platform of no one is to be left behind. And people are being left behind. People are being left behind. This is the confusing thing. We've got a Liberal MP saying increased job seeker, a, a Labor <laughs> minister <laughs> from... I, I was wondering if I had the party right? <laughs> No, you're all confused. <laughs> All right. We'll wait till Tuesday night. We'll wait till Tuesday night. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Joseph Amarina. Minister, are you aware of the many services community pharmacies like mine do for my patients for free based on my prescription income, such as home deliveries, free blood pressure checks, opening late and on weekends late, just to name a few? I will not be able to afford to continue these services if the 60-day dispensing proceeds. How is it that this does not leave my patients and my community worse off? So, uh, Joseph, just, just quickly, I just want to check with you on this. We're obviously talking here about the, the announcement the Minister's made uh, to allow people with a chronic illness to have 60 days of, of medicine rather than a 30-day script. Are you saying that your pharmacy won't be able to open on weekends as Absolutely. a result? Absolutely. You'll have to shut. Well, we have to look at the services that we provide. So, if, <coughs> so it's it's just a matter of mathematics more than anything else. Less incomes come, comes into the pharmacy. How are we supposed to pay our pharmacists, our staff? It's just not possible. Okay, Minister. <coughs> so the decision I took last week was to accept um, advice that had been on the table for five years. <clears throat> which is that people on stable chronic disease medicines can get 60 days dispensed medicine instead of 30 days. This is very common around the world, the UK, Canada, many other countries besides. <clears throat> and what it will do is halve the cost of medicines for 6 million Australians. It will halve the cost. It will halve the number of times they have to go to a GP to get their repeat script um, renewed. Now, every dollar that we save as a Commonwealth Government, we will be re-injecting back into community pharmacies so that you can do more of those services. We announced some on Friday. We'll give access to community pharmacies to the entire national immunisation program, to opioid dependents. There will be more announcements that we make. So every dollar we save in the budget will go back into community pharmacy. But I don't make any apology for halving the cost of medicines for six million of the most vulnerable Australians who occasionally are on these medicines, not just for years, but for decades, but have to go back to a pharmacy every single month to have their script refilled. This was advice from the experts that the former government, to, for some reason, decided not to follow. I've decided to follow it. So if... if... If the money that's being saved here is all going back into community pharmacies, are you saying that uh, Joseph's pharmacy should be able to do all the things it's doing and stay open <coughs> on the weekends? Well, there will be a saving um, by consumers, not, not the Commonwealth Government saving. We estimate that will be about $1.6 billion over four years. But to put that in context, community pharmacy will earn over $100 billion over the next four years. So we're talking somewhere in the vicinity of one to one and a half per cent of their revenue. And that's going off the pharmacy's own, own numbers. Okay, but will Joseph have to wait for Tuesday night as well to see what more might be coming to... Um... It's going to be a big night. It's be a big night. <laughs> Does any of that uh, give no, you make any confidence? Me. I mean, it's just a case of mathematics. On the average, $175,000 is taken out of each pharmacy uh, income, gross income, in a year. Where am I supposed to pay get those funds to pay my pharmacist. I'd like to have an answer to that, and so would every out of 5,000 I don't have pharmacies in Australia. We wait? Well, I, I just gave the answer, which is that every dollar we save, we're reinvesting back into community pharmacy. I want to see community pharmacists deliver more services, not just processing repeat the, scripts, but delivering more services jobs? of the types that I just talked about. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to make 6 million patients with chronic disease 
many of them pensioners, continue to pay a monthly fee to pharmacists when the Medicines Authority said five years ago they shouldn't have to do that. Since that time, over five years, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars have been paid out by those patients when they didn't need to. Sarah, let me just ask you on this. Um, it, as the Minister points out, there are plenty of other countries that give 60-day scripts. Uh, it makes it a lot cheaper for them, though, those with a chronic illness. This has been, as he points out, uh, the recommendation of the, um, the authorities here. What, what do you think from an international perspective about a move like that? It might hurt some local pharmacies, though. Well, look, I mean, the, I can't, obviously I don't know anything about the specifics of the, uh, of the numbers or the investment, um, but, you know, assuming we can take the minister at his word that he's going to invest it back to make sure that those services are covered, then it sounds sensible to me. I certainly think that for any of us as individuals, who, when we have to pay for prescriptions, you know, anything that seems to be creating opportunities where, you know, forcing us to do something that we have to do for our own health, um, that, is, that is creating, you know, uh, um, what might seem like excess profit to some, if not um, to all. I mean, I, you know, I, I grew up in the United States, which has, which has, you know, one of the most free market approaches mm -hmm. to medicine in the developed world, if you not can, the most. You can get your, your um, drugs at the supermarket. And well, you, you can get anything at the supermarket, including guns um, in America, <laughs> because it is uh, because it is su such an extreme um, free market and so uh, so very deregulated now. Um, and having lived now for 20 years in the UK with um, a national health service that does cover prescriptions for chronic illnesses, I mean, I have low thyroid and the, and the NHS covers that for me. It's incredibly important for people that, that, that they have access um, to those kinds of services. So I'm just glad to be listening to a conversation where people are actually taking that seriously. Bridget Archer, where are you on, on this one? Are you, do you support what the minister is doing here or do you support the local pharmacies? Well, I think what I want to avoid is a, a, that exactly that sort of either or situation. I think it needs to be a conversation. And I think we do have to, of course, listen to patients and we should always have patients at the centre of what we are seeking to do. Sounds but a bit like you're sitting that, on the fence, though, no, to be, but to I be think uh, it's part with of respect. That, um, you know, the conversation we were having earlier about the kind of health ecosystem, community pharmacists are also an important part mm. of that. And I don't want to see a situation where we're sort of, um, you know, having a, an argument um, or positioning community pharmacists as something, you know, as the bad guy, because they're not. And they feel an important um, role in our health ecosystem. And if they are raised raising some concerns, it's reasonable to listen to them. And I think it's around cost. But, you know, pharmacists have also raised some of those issues about their concerns around stockpiling medications or uh, medication shortages. Um, the advice that they provide to patients when they're seeing patients regularly as well, particularly if they're not able to access a GP in the same way. So, you know, whilst I see what the Minister uh, is trying to achieve, I would urge, of course, that um, we listen to the voice of community pharmacists okay, and that we don't day, play okay, people okay, off sorry, against sorry, each to, other. Sorry to butt in, but what, what does that mean? Do you, do you go to the 60-day scripts for people with a chronic illness or not? Well, I think that part of the issue that pharmacists have raised is they don't feel that they've been consulted about that. And so I don't necessarily have a view around whether that is the right way okay. to go or whether it's the right way to go in isolation or whether we need to also listen to pharmacists about, OK, if we're doing that, what else might we need to okay. do to ensure the ongoing viability of community pharmacy? Because if that is threatened, then we are complicating and worsening um, already a difficult health ecosystem. All right, next we'll hear from Moate Dambo. Question for <coughs> Bridget Archer. Where do you feel the Liberal Party has gone wrong and what can the party do to begin to win back grassroots supporters and their traditional voting base? Uh, look, I think it's a, um, a not an entirely straightforward uh, answer. I think that there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of evidence, if you like, from the post-2022 election and the Aston by-election as well about some of the places where the party um, has gone wrong. I think that there's also been, you know, something of a, a shift. Um, you know, I think I heard Amy Ramikis on uh, your, your show, David, the other day, talking about the fact that maybe the centre's not where people think the centre is anymore as well. I think our constituencies, uh, you know, have changed over, over time. Um, I uh, think that uh, we need to 
get back to those uh, those values. I think we've lost our identity in a way. I often hear, um, you know, right wing commentators particularly say, "Well, we we don't want to be um, labour light." Well, I think there's very little danger of that at the moment because I think where we currently find ourselves is probably nationals light or at times one nation light. <laughs> um, and actually, I think what's happened is that. What, just what makes um, you think that? Look, I think that we have seen an increasing shift to the right, but also I under, think... Under Peter Dutton? Uh, I think going back much further than that. Uh, but I think what we've also seen in terms of the political landscape mm -hmm. is that um, Labor, who um, has been in opposition for some time, uh, they are very hungry to get back to government. They have found, a, you know... A, uh, they have, um, I think, moved further to um, the centre, if you like, uh, in that demographic uh, shift. Uh, and so they are probably occupying a place where the Liberals have um, over, you know, so historically do you find yourself, do you find yourself more in line with Labor then as a result than the Liberal Party today? Uh, well, obviously not, because I think they should raise <laughs> job seeker, but... <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Could no, you tell in, in that one earlier? <laughs> yeah, in, in all seriousness, you know, you, you um, not only is a job seeker where you're at odds with most of your party colleagues, but uh, climate targets, you're in, in, in line with Labor, the Indigenous Voice, the National Integrity Commission, all of these issues. Do you find yourself more aligned with the Labor Party? Not really. I find myself aligned with my constituency. And I think that that's the point, is that, um, you know, I think that the party has lost its way, I think, um, and uh, spends a lot of time uh, navel-gazing, I think, um, rather than listening to uh, the voices of the constituency. And I think that there's a danger... Um, and a temptation, in fact, within political parties generally, um, it's, it can become an echo chamber and you're only hearing from the same voices. And what we need to be doing if we are going to be electorally successful uh, into the future is that we need to start listening to the voices of our communities. Anthony, what, what do you think as an observer on, on this, why the Liberal Party is struggling at the moment uh, and, and, and some of what Bridget Archer is saying there about oh. the party being an echo chamber and so on? Yeah, look, possibly it, the struggle could be about the voice. I mean, it seems to be taking up so much room and oxygen. Um, and, you know, we've seen some high-profile resignations. So mm. that's what comes to mind. Um, do you want me to elaborate on the voice at all? Well, I'm... well if, 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 if you'd like. Yeah, it, look, just the question, though, is about the Liberal Party here and why yeah. it's in trouble and... Yeah, what look, it needs uh, to do to get back to its traditional base. Um, uh, we'll know after referendum what, what um, mm. direction it's going to go on, go in. Um, but the voice seems to be the big thing that's unsettling. And you think this is this is one of the main reasons why the Liberal Party's having trouble? It's at the you know off the cuff. That's what comes to mind. <laughs> Um, mm. So, what, just explain to us and, and to those who may not be aware, your view on The Voice, why you are opposed to it. Look, um, because I haven't heard the detail how... And we've spoken in this session today about mm. the health crisis, OK? Mm. And it's, you know, even greater in the Indigenous population. So, we want to know, how will The Voice help lift the health standards and, and well-being of Indigenous Australians? If that was spelt out, I might <laughs> vote for it, but at okay. this stage... I, I can't say. Well, Mark Butler, yes can it. you spell that out as a member of a government that's proposing this? Well, I mean, I think I think recognition in and of itself is critically important. I mean, it's more than thirty oh, agreed, years. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. It's more than thirty years since the High Court swept away this fiction that that this was vacant land when Europeans arrived, and it's about time our constitution reflected that. But you no, give I think every, everyone would agree yeah. with that. Yeah. <clears throat> but you, you give meaning to that recognition by giving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people a voice and. Uh, as the health minister, this, this idea that it shouldn't be a voice to the executive, I think, is utterly ridiculous. I mean, given how important health is, why on earth would a voice not make representations to the health minister mm. and, and the health point, department? How does it help with health outcomes and, and in know, Indigenous communities? I mean, I, I know that, that um, uh, having a, 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 a thoughtful, considered voice from mm. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people themselves would help me develop the best possible okay. um, Indigenous health policy. I've no doubt about that. Is that well, I've, shift your view? I think, there's, I think there's already many Indigenous voices telling you about health. There's many, yeah. that's right. So to say but that... Having, having, one, having one voice that takes all of those regional and local voices, um, representations into consideration, of course it doesn't mean I wouldn't be talking to all of the, you know, really valuable um, 
long-term voices in Indigenous health, but having that community-wide voice talking for their community about Indigenous health would be incredibly valuable for me as a health minister. All right, something to think about. All right, thank you for that. Now, we can bring you the results of our online poll that we asked earlier. Should all vapes be banned for anyone without a prescription? Here's how you voted. 67% say yes and 30% say no. Uh, so, Mark Butler, just quickly, will that 67% be um, happy with what you announce tomorrow? <laughs> Tune in to the ABC at lunchtime. <laughs> Thought I'd try one more time. Hey? And to finish tonight's discussion, here's Elliot Tripp. I'm a born and bred and proud Tasmanian. The Albanese government has pledged $240 million to build a new Hobart stadium to guarantee a Tasmanian AFL team. <clears throat> Tasmania has survived many years without one, so why do we need one now? <laughs> we have an acute housing issue and an overwhelmed healthcare system. Why do the government's priorities not reflect the communities? <laughs> Just very quickly, Mark Butler. Oh, to me. Yep. Well, that was to you're, you're in the government. The question's about why is the government giving this money? Well, I mean, I don't accept the, the, the idea that this is... that health is not our priority, housing is not our priority. I'm down in Tasmania, as is the Prime Minister, talking to Premier Rockcliffe about things we can do together in those areas. And the redevelopment of Macquarie Point, that area just off the bridge in Hobart, will be a full urban redesign. It will have housing, including social and affordable housing in it as and well. A big this is not a big just stadium. a stadium. A big stadium. But it will have a multi-use stadium. And, and as someone from Adelaide who had um, the Adelaide Oval redesign, okay. it, has, it has rejuvenated that side okay. of the river. Um, it led to a whole lot of different business activity. It's a great place to go and watch footy, but, but it's, it's had a whole lot of economic okay. benefits as well. I mean, I'm not a Tasmanian, so... so well, Bridget Archer, you are. So, a final word to you just briefly on this. Where do you stand? Do you, yeah, do you think look, this should go ahead or not? No. I mean, I, I couldn't agree uh, more in terms of what are the priorities for our state. In fact, I fought an election in 2019. You know, the Labor uh, Party at that time was proposing to put $25 million into Hobart AFL and we put $25 million into the health system um, instead. And, you know, um, we hear that it's, it's not either or, but, but I, I go back to what I said earlier. We're not seeing any evidence that it's not either or. Um, there's some great work been going on, um, but there needs to be more. And again, I, I would say that for a Labor government, you know, I think it is um, extraordinary to be elected on a platform of saying that no one will be left behind. And the Prime Minister would have had to drive past people living in tents to get to that announcement on the weekend. And I just don't think that's good enough. All right, thank you, Elliot. Thank you for the question as well. That's all we have time for tonight. Thanks to our panel, Sarah Churchwell, Anthony Dillon, Mark Butler, Bridget Archer and Mukesh Haikawal. Thank you all for sharing your stories and your questions tonight. Next week, Stan Grant will be back with you live from Sydney following the King's coronation. There's going to be plenty to discuss after that. And joining the panel, renowned Scottish author Irvin Welsh, who wrote Train Spotting and is in Australia for the Brisbane Writers' Festival. Republican, Olympian and former politician Nova Peris, the Assistant Minister for Treasury Andrew Lee, Independent Senator for Tasmania Jackie Lambie and lawyer and commentator Carolyn DeRusso. Head to our website to register to be in the audience. We'll see you then. Good night.